Welcome to the Health Enthusiasm Podcast, a panel discussion on behaviors, innovations, and trends in health and self-care. My name is Christophe Choquet. I'm the author of the book called Health Enthusiasm and a global keynote speaker on the future of health and self-care business. Every month, I discuss with a panel of experts the positive changes that are shaping our health and happiness. And today we have two of our beloved experts. We have our American in Paris and medical expert in digital health, Aditi Joshi. Hello, everyone. From London, customer experience expert and research expert Krupa Suter. Hi everybody. This means we are missing our digital health connector Aline Noizet and our human experience expert Mo Zouina. In that case we always try to invite a special guest in this case two special guests to our panel some new blood some other expertise. And our first guest is an internationally recognized digital health moderator and speaker with a focus on global healthcare digitization. Brain Lab has put her on the list of the nine digital health experts to follow on LinkedIn. And according to HealthTech, she is one of the top 30 healthcare IT influencers in the world. But you may know her as the host of the amazing podcast, Faces of Digital Health, a podcast made to help create a world where healthcare doesn't lag behind other industries and technological process. A world where patients get the necessary treatments regardless of their country of residence or social status. Welcome, Chiasha Zeitsch. Hi. Now we have our second guest. I always make sure to be notified when this man posts something on LinkedIn. His insights, opinions, and visions on the future of healthcare are simply said thought-provoking. Every time again, I, it challenges me to rethink my convictions or ideas. This guest is convinced that technology will drive a major change in the coming decade, and he clearly wants to be part of shaping that transformation. He's working for a boutique consultancy agency called TLGG as the healthcare director. Welcome, welcome Thomas Hagemeyer. Hello, everyone. Together, we want to amplify the health enthusiasm that we see in articles, new business ventures, or simply even in the world around us. Now, if you're new to the show, you might wonder what health enthusiasm is all about. Well, health enthusiasm is the aspiration that we all have to be healthy and happy. And as a result of this, every company or organization is now more than ever focused on making their customers healthier and happier. So tell me, Aditi, we missed you last month. What health enthusiasm did you witness in the time you were away? This is just more of an opinion piece, but Bill Gates had something about the future of healthcare and whatever you think about him and the way he runs his businesses, he is one of the titans of tech. And so it's interesting to find out what he was talking about as far as health is concerned. And so obviously, just like everywhere, he's talking about AI quite a bit. And for me, what I find most interesting is that as I've been traveling or to other conferences recently, that stress on AI has finally filtered into clinical medicine, which takes a bit longer for that to happen. And so I've seen a lot more companies, a lot more departments actually take in the idea of how are we going to use AI. And one of the ones that he actually mentions that I find is going to be really interesting is going to be the use of it for ultrasounds and and using AI to improve the way that we read ultrasounds and be able to get uh, digital images from even places that are geographically far away and be able to get care out to those regions. We use the ultrasound a lot in emergency medicine. And so for us, it's actually something that we probably think of just as much as our physical exam with our hands and our stethoscope because we use it often. And so being able to take that and take the advances we've made in diagnostics and treatment with the ultrasound that we've made in the last few decades and being able to use that remotely is going to be a huge, huge advancement for any type of acute or emergency or OB-GYN care. Yeah. Was that written in the, uh, I think he wrote a a blog post on the future of AI. Was that mentioned in there as well? Because that's where it was, the AI, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Amazing uh, letter. It was so, so interesting. I I went through it, but there was so much in there that um, I saw that piece passing by as well. Regarding Microsoft and, and AI, what I also heard was that there's this company called Nuance Communications. It's a medical software uh, that is owned by Microsoft and it's announced that, I mean, it's, it's a voice enabled uh, application, um, but it announced that it has already integrated with OpenAI's GPT-4. What it does, Nuance can now, you know, automate clinical documentation by simply listening to patient and physician conversations during uh, the medical visits. 
And so, and, and so by the, by adding, you know, GPT-4, it can really create apparently very strong uh, clinical notes and merely seconds after the patient visits. And it's immediately also integrated with the um, atomic medical health record as well. So Microsoft AI, although Bill Gates is no longer a really part of uh, Microsoft, but um, this whole AI Microsoft thing is still going on very uh, strong. Tiasha, what uh, health reasons did you see in uh, the recent months? Maybe just a very brief comment on the news that you just mentioned. Yeah. So I think that uh, voice uh, tech uh, is going to be very important in uh, the way that workflows are managed uh, for clinicians and how much time do they need to spend with IT. These are all quite not exactly old ideas, but this is something that has been mentioned already, you know, in 2017 when Health 2.0 was still taking place across the world. So Health 2.0 was a conference that was focused on digital innovations and then was acquired by HIMSS. So the key thing that I think is going to be important here is just the decreased burden on clinicians in terms of uh, notes taking. But what I saw, so I actually attended uh, the NextMed uh, conference in the US uh, not so long ago. And NextMed is basically a conference that kind of uh, positions itself as the cutting edge latest innovation provider on the market and giving you an overview of what's the latest uh, things that are happening. And from the EU perspective or the European perspective, I'm uh, kind of fascinated by how the whole healthcare system is uh, shifting more and more into retail in the US. So you've got uh, companies like CVS, Walgreens that are really moving into primary care. Now there's a hospital network that's partnering with Best Buy. So Best Buy will take over the installations and the education of patients for remote care in their home. So Best Buy is an electronics provider, retail provider, just to clarify that. So these are all uh, interesting uh, shifts in care provisions. And obviously at NextMed, there were innovations such as Open Water. Uh, it's also a US company rethinking the way we use and to take advantage of sounds and basically sound and uh, vision technology. And they um, are innovating in the space of uh, using non-invasive uh, wearables to uh, impact cells in the body. So you don't need very uh, intrusive uh, therapies, for example, in cancer care. So those were kind of the two things that kind of stood out for me uh, lately. So the fact that in, uh, that there's a lot of business involvement in healthcare in, in the US is certainly an interesting one. I think we, we talked about it before. There's so much pressure on the healthcare system over there that business is trying to fill in a gap by innovating at an, at an increased speed. And, and, and so my question would be like, will this happen in the same way in, in Europe? Because we're also heading towards a more of um collapsing healthcare system, perhaps even. And so we'll also hear business be able to um play a role and, and what will be the results of that. But I, I guess that Thomas will be um talking about this a little bit later in the podcast as well. Um, Thomas, what what health system did you um, bring along? Yeah, it's something which is, uh, I think, very linked to um, to what was just said. In the end, the one event that happened, I think, two or three weeks ago was um, it's, it's a small event, but I think a good uh, a good news in these challenging times uh, when startups are struggling to raise money. It was a Doctor Lee that raised ten million. It's not a, a big amount, but the Doctor Lee is a German startup that is basically reinventing EHR software for uh, ambulatory care. And, and I think it all ties up to what was just said, basically. What, what excites me the most is, is these two layers. So the EHR layer for ambulatory that is being reinvented by players like Dr. Lee. You have in Europe Dr. Lee Medicine as well that is trying to, to make it happen in France a bit with, uh, I mean, a bit struggling, but still. And I think exactly you need to, to tie that up with what was just said with the kind of, I will say, the consolidation of ambulatory through chains and mostly GP chains. So that was like CVS, obviously, that just purchased Signify Health, Walgreens. I will name also ChainMed in the mix. It was a very interesting GP chain, a value-based care GP chain in the US. But actually, funnily, the, in Europe, the same trend is happening, obviously, like we're five years, uh, five years behind, but you have 
uh, AVI Medical in Germany that has 15 practices and which is, um, which is scaling. And you have also Dr. Dropin, 15 practices in Norway that is just now expanding in Europe. So you see this kind of GP chain uh, logic happening. And the key question for me is what kind of EHR software will, what kind of tech stack will the GP chain have? And if they manage to scale and have a, a, obviously a proper tech stack, which is the hypothesis, then the whole adoption of the innovation that we see every day will be much easier because I think that's where the problem lies, less in the innovation itself, but more in the adoption. So I'm quite excited to see like players like Dr. Lee getting founding. I think it's a very challenging topic, obviously, but I think this kind of phase of, of primary care chains and also the meta trend of, of doctors that the new doctors coming in that don't want to be the owners of their own practice. They want to be employed most of the time in burger practices. This meta trends playing means that in the five to 10 years, we'll have a much lower barrier for adoption because this is where the problem lies, not less in the innovation and the adoption. So all these kind of trends, uh, looking at that, that's, that makes me like confident that, that the adoption hurdle, which is very high still today will, will be lower. Do you think that the adoption hurdle has to do with the fact that most of the solutions are still very local as well? Because you mentioned Germany, you mentioned France, you mentioned the Nordics. A lot of the, of the solutions are very local, which m- makes it very difficult to, to roll it out at a larger scale. And I think if you don't, if you can't roll it out at a big scale, it kind of has an impact on your revenues. It kind of has an impact on the means you have to convince maybe physicians as well to do it. Does that, does that play a role there or? Yeah, I think at the end, yeah, of course, it's not like, it's not like the, like a retail, uh, uh, consumer business where you can scale it, you know, globally very quickly. But even that, I think even locally, I mean, if you can crack Germany, it's already big enough to, to be like financial. But even at that level, if you look at the structure of the, of the market, I mean, I, I looked at the number in the US, you have 200,000 practices, uh, practices, you know, medical practices. How do you want to scale across 200,000 practices if they are like very fragmented? I think in Germany, I think you are, might have 60,000 practices or maybe like maybe 60 to 80. So I think it's like just, you know, you need like thousands of sales reps, you know, in order to, and then, and then obviously you have the tech stack that doesn't integrate. We know that changing EHR system for me, which is the heart of the system, uh, is kind of open heart surgery for any physician. So you, we need to, 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 I mean, it's a bit like silly to say that, but we need to like older physicians to retire, close their practice, and then this new GP chain with a new tech stack come in and are able to integrate this whole technology. And that will be much easier to do it that way. So that's a- I fully agree. And yeah, talking about scale, US, Europe, I saw, I don't know if you've seen it, Krupa, but I saw Maven Clinic, which is a virtual care solution for basically everyone who is planning or starting or raising a family. They are US based, but they bought Natal, which is a UK based women's health provider. Did you see that happening? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, by, I think it's uh, Leila Nabert. So, yeah, they purchased that or acquired it earlier this week, actually. And it was on the day that we had Wired Health Conference here in the UK, so the 21st of March. So, yeah, a really nice acquisition there. And so, do you get any, any health users for me as well then? Yeah, sure. So mine are actually around uh, quality of life, essentially. So slightly different on the topics that um, we've been discussing so far. So you may have seen from the World Happiness Report earlier this week that Finland was reported to be the happiest country again in the world. So that's the sixth year in a row. And it's followed by its neighbours, Denmark and Sweden, Iceland and Norway. The report is based on scores such as life expectancy, social support, crime and uh, the levels of community support, which all contributed to its retaining its um, number one position. Just to note, though, the UK, I believe, has gone down. It's now 19th in the rankings. US is 20th. And then you've got the Australia as 12th and Canada as 13th. But um, interesting, an interesting report there. My second health enthusiasm, again, is related to quality of life, pertains to March, which is known as Endometriosis Awareness Month. This is a condition that affects approximately 167 million women worldwide. In the UK, it's estimated that one in 10 women have the disease and it equivalates at roughly around 1.5 million women in the UK, which is roughly the same as the, the number of people who have diabetes. 
The factor here is that it takes an average of eight years to be diagnosed as a condition, and it can only be properly diagnosed through uh, keyhole surgery, so through a, a laparoscopy. But it can affect a woman's daily life. She can be in constant pain through to the fact that it can affect with her family planning if that is something that she wishes to do. And they're often prescribed ongoing medication, which can be hormone based. But later on this year, and obviously that's going to have side effects in itself. However, later on this year, there's going to be a trial in the UK of 100 women. So those women are based in Edinburgh and in London. And it will assess whether the drug that their half of the women are going to be given will help relieve the pain. So the trial will last around 12 weeks and they'll receive the painkiller. And then they'll have to complete surveys and provide blood samples to see if that treatment is effective for relieving that pain and any any other symptoms that they may get as well. And it's known that women who have endometriosis uh, produce high amounts of lactate. And in the lab experiments that they've been conducting, when uh, this drug was administered, what they found was that lactate production reduced to normal levels and therefore produced a better quality um, of life. Um, And the endometriosis lesions actually reduced So if this drug works, it could be potentially life changing for millions of women across the world to lead to a better quality of life for them. Would be lovely indeed. And I have, you talked about quality of life indeed, and you talked about happiness. Um, There was one article that comes close to it, or that's a little bit related to um, how we feel and that it's, it was about Michelin guides. I don't know if you saw that passing by, but apparently, you know, the the Michelin guide stars and that, that that are awarded to, um, to, to restaurants. But you have to know that the chef Cox, they, they really try to have that star. It's a lifelong pursuit. And now when they get one, they're really scared to, um, to losing it, of course. And apparently what is happening right now, if a Michelin star restaurant loses one of their stars, they are contacted in specific ways separately. They're not just called. It's not just a mail. People go there to talk to them, to really debate what it's about, how it comes, to really help them. Because apparently it kind of can hit somebody really hard. In fact, in France, I think there were several deaths by suicide because Michelin star chefs lost their um, stars. So I really like that article because it shows how even an, an organization like the Michelin Guide is, is taking that into account. And the maybe final one that I really liked in the past month was uh, Nintendo. I know, Krupa, you mentioned it as well, is that Nintendo announced that it will launch a Pokemon Sleep application in the summer. And the idea is that you place your phone near your pillow to track your sleep. And the better you sleep, the more new, you know, different Pokemons that will show up in the game for you. Which is, I think, it's a debatable uh, subject, uh, but it's it's not the first time that Nintendo is going into health or self-care. I mean, we all know the Wii Fit fitness game. Recently for the Nintendo Switch, they also uh, launched uh, the Ring Fit Adventure to actually have people exercise a little bit more. In 2014, apparently they announced and launched a quality of life initiative, which is related to gaming. And then something that uh, somebody mentioned to me was, was, was something I really didn't know is that in 1993, Nintendo had this thing called Captain Novolin, which was a character in, I think it was Mario, but it was a, a Super Nintendo character that wanted to, to teach kids to manage their insulin. And that was 1993. So Nintendo has always been an early player in the health uh, sphere. And I really liked um, those examples. Thank you all for your examples. It is a a health enthusiasm world indeed. We can see so many positive changes that are making our world a little healthier and happier every day. I personally, I really enjoy watching these changes unfold. I analyze them. I try to understand the broader impact of these changes. And I even write a newsletter about it. It's called it's a health enthusiasm world. If you're interested, go and discover them on healthenthusiasm.com. Now, every month during the Health Enthusiasm podcast, I'll recap one particular newsletter for the panel to debate, but not this week. This week, we will do something different. So I mentioned in the introduction of Thomas that we actually, but that he actually is somebody to follow on LinkedIn because he brings out once a week, I believe so, a very interesting post that is worth thinking about. And so instead of me just bringing my newsletter this week or this month, I'd love to have Thomas 
bring a certain idea, a certain reflection, a certain evolution that he has been seeing in recent times. So, Thomas, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think quite tied to what I just said at the beginning, this um, this whole primary care space is uh, is shaping. And I posted, um, I think it was one month ago, about uh, about four events, four very recent events that happened in um, in primary care. One being about the, I mean, it's a bit like not linked directly, but um, but the AI based stethoscope, uh, which is quite that was uh, revealed at the at the CES conference earlier this year. I think it's interesting in the sense of uh, you know, like you can connect the stethoscope to telehealth, so there are like some new approaches, and I think it's more symbolic. The stethoscope is obviously a physician is always associated with his stethoscope. So like being so putting some AI there with some uh, uh, for sound is, is an interesting development. I don't know exactly if it's more the symbolic really. Then I think the, the whole, uh, the whole space about um, the Spotify founder just, just brought to market the AI power body health scanner. So it's basically for primary care. You will go to your GP and you will have a full body scanner. And I think it's it's obviously still a, a bit of a, of a prototype, but but if you think again and link it to what that I said, what I said at the beginning with kind of GP chains, so if a Walgreens decide that this kind of whole body scanner is interesting, then I mean there is obviously the whole privacy concern and everything. But if you start having the whole body scanner of everyone, uh, you can start going towards virtual train and obviously have new kind of care delivery models that are that are interesting. What happened also in February, so one month ago, CVS acquiring Oak Street Health, a value-based care company. So here you see a lot that was a syndicate health that was acquired. So you have a lot of, of retail clinics that are acquiring value-based care players. So I believe really that value-based care, it's a topic that has been there for 20 years, but will happen at scale, most uh, mostly in primary care first. And then the last thing that happened as well, everything very recently, uh, is obviously the Amazon Clinic. Example. So there was Amazon Care for those that remember, and Amazon Care failed. And Amazon Care was a digital only approach. And actually, what Amazon did, then they bought one medical for those who remember. I think it happened mid last year. One medical, which is also a GP chain in the US of 150 clinics. So they, the first thing is Amazon Care moved toward the digital only, towards brick and mortar, but digital first approach in, 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 uh, in primary care. And then after that, they launched Amazon Clinic, which is a very interesting model, actually inspired from China. They put telehealth messaging as a model there. And I think why it's interesting, they did it only for 20 selected conditions. So like very common conditions that are quite simple. So not very like allergies. I mean, something where as a patient or as a user, you will know what, what you could have. So it's really about, first of all, the segmentation of the primary care. And okay, if it's something very simple, we can cover it with telehealth messaging. So there is this first piece of innovation about the segmentation of primary care and easy telehealth messaging. The second piece of innovation is really about the, the messaging itself. So it's so efficient because obviously they use AI to analyze all the messages at the end. The physician just has to click and say, okay, prescribe this. I mean, just, uh, but basically it's so, it's so efficient as a delivery model that in the U S is as expensive or even cheaper than the copay. So for, for those not familiar in the U S and even if you have an insurance, you have the copay. So you have to pay a bit every time as, as an insurer. And here without any insurance, because they don't accept insurance, they're actually cheaper or as expensive than the copay in the, in the care delivery. So very efficient model, which is very interesting, obviously, if you if consider the kind of rising cost pressure on the whole healthcare system. And also the third innovation is Amazon Clinic is also that Amazon is acting as an AI telehealth ag- aggregator. So they are not providing themselves the telehealth, they are integrating Specialized health players, you mentioned Maven, for example, that is specialized in women's health. They could integrate Maven or for dermatology or for allergies. So they would basically integrate specialized telehealth players. And I think that's a bit the trend we see. You see a lot of specialized telehealth in dermatology and they are basically acting as an aggregator. So using their huge, obviously, database, all the prime millions of prime members and plugging the telehealth. So that's this kind of AI as a telehealth aggregator model. Of Amazon is very interesting because obviously it brings the scale that that uh, this uh, telehealth specialized telehealth player wouldn't wouldn't have had. 
So yeah, this, these four innovations in primary care for me is uh, uh, very interesting. And uh, I believe that primary care is, is right now the most exciting. I mean, the very exciting stuff, but in terms of structurally changing the healthcare system, I think that's, that's, that's the most interesting right now. But yeah, I would be happy to, to, to understand what you um, uh, think. I think one last thing maybe before the, as an entry point as well, talking about AI. And, and primary care, I think, I think GPs, obviously, we, we live in a world that is where GPs and physicians, physicians especially are always more specialized. So, you know, you have like 150 years ago, you had one GP that was doing everything. And the more complex healthcare went, the more specialization you had. So now you have obviously oncologists, you have specialized oncologists, you have the specialized of the, the specialist of specialist. So, I mean, you have a complexity that is rising. And I think at some point it's not, it's not manageable, manageable anymore. If you want to get diagnosed, you have to see like five, six, seven different type of, of physicians. So I think the one of the thesis as well, and that's linked to primary care is that AI will enable, will start at the very end with the specialist, but then move upstream. And then at some point the GP will be equipped with AI and technology to, I mean, it will take some time to see this be the end game to be able to make decisions that the specialists will make today. I think it's good for the system because to reduce complexity, reduce the time to diagnosis that was just talked about in the case of endometriosis. And then you could have the rise of a super GP that will basically come back in a way 150 years ago when there was only one GP covering all the types of disease. So it's a big like... Uh, coming back to the past, obviously, but with with AI as a, as a tool for to make it happen. So yeah, I mean that's that's a bit like my my thoughts on on primary care. It would be very very interesting to know what what the group thinks. Maybe I don't know. Thinking with uh, with uh, starting with you, maybe um, Christoph, you have seen the post. I mean, why do you find it interesting? So yeah, just curious. Uh, I post every week, so why this one and not another? <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, there's a lot in there. I mean, as you, as you as we could hear. hear there's a lot going on, mainly in the States right now. And I like the way you put forward. I mean, there's five changes out there, right? You catch people at the beginning of the care journey. It's consolidating a fragmented primary care market. It's making sure that value-based healthcare becomes, you know, a reality. And it's also making sure that we have a little bit of, of, of more data-driven prevention, which, which is totally or largely lacking at least right now. So I, I like those four things, but I really like the idea about the super GP that you mentioned, because I'm not quite sure about it. It made me think because I, I just, I think a couple of months before I, I wrote a newsletter on how the first line is being, you know, under pressure by all, all these changes, by AI, by digital health in general. And I think you're struggling with the massive influx of all these um, digital health solutions. And I'm not quite sure how, how it will go. I mean, think about in, in the early 2000s, we had Google. You know, Google search, Dr. Google, as we said. And maybe you remember these wall signs or even the, the coffee cups that says, do not confuse your Google search with my medical degree. And it was very easy for a doctor to say that and just say, you know, basically get lost. I know better than, than, than what you found online. So they to basically downplay everything that, that patients found online. I think that won't be possible in the near future because the solutions that will be entering through primary care or through any type of channel and that will reach patients that patients can use themselves will actually equip them in such a way that they probably might even know better than the physician or at least the physician might not know exactly the value of a certain digital health solution because there's so many digital health solutions out there they come from all over the world basically it's just it's hard to regulate them and so how will a, a first-line physician you know, actually go about it. I mean, will they understand where it's coming from? Will they understand the value? Will they be able to to actually deal with those requests? And it will no longer be like guiding a patient into the healthcare ecosystem, which they are doing right now. I mean, a general physician is, is just looking at a lot of pathologies and just saying, just go to that, see that specialist, go see that specialist, because I believe that you might be having this or that. No, it's really, it will really be about guiding a patients into the digital health ecosystem and helping them understand what is actually brought forward. And that might be local, <laughs> that might be international, that might be global, it might be reimbursed, it might not be reimbursed, it might be be part of an insurance coverage or not. So this is, to me, this is kind of like pretty much a huge, huge challenge for the entire first line. We're talking general practitioners, super GPs, but I'm also thinking about sick funds, mutualities in Europe. Um, I'm talking about private health insurances. I'm talking about pharmacists. I mean, I've worked with quite some of these stakeholders and they all are looking into how can we change 
you know, the way that we work, how can we deal with all these digital solutions that will be coming from many different angles? And so to me, the question was, is it really the super GP? Will he be able to cover all that? Or will he just become what I call a care guider who will guide people left and right, not really knowing or 100 fully, fully percent, uh, fully understanding what is really going on and, and whether something that the patient has brought forward is actually valuable or not. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think it will take time. I think we, we all agree. We all have uh, the example of what's on health, I think, in mind. So, I mean, what they promise and what happened. <laughs> I think it would be very interesting in the in your opinion, Aditi. I think you work as, a, as an emergency physician, which is in a way, you also cover a lot of indications. And your opinion on, on this super GP as a physician is also very valuable because in the end, there is always a bit of a, of a disconnect between how digital health let's say, aficionados and then the reality on the ground. So it would be interesting how you look at it and, and, and if you see potential and what, what needs to happen in order to, I mean, is it something we want to happen? You know, do you want to be, as an emergency physician, the one that actually that can, I mean, you won't be able to decide everything, but at least, you know, cover more of the downstream or, or do you think it's not actually the way to go? No, it's a great question. So I think in general, our primary care physicians, we don't call them GPs, we call them PCPs, but... Um, they need a lot more support than they're getting, right? We're, we're going to have a huge doctor shortage and most of them will be from primary care. And so to streamline or make their jobs easier is going to be necessary. And that can happen in two ways. You either make their workflows and clinical workflows like uh, some of these companies are trying to do much more efficient so that they have the avail- availability of data and can apply it to their patients much more easily and efficiently so they don't have to be overburdened with administrative tasks that takes them away from patient care and then go actually to the parts that are reimbursable to them, right? So that's one way. And then, you know, the second is really taking out some of their processes entirely and using AI for them, some of the ones, as you mentioned, and then that way they can either, I mean, I don't think they're going to be fully replaced, but I think either you can actually have them specialize into things and do things that they're more interested in uh, while the screening and prevention things are automated. And then as a catch-all place for all of the data to come through. And the reality is it might be both, but it's not going to be quickly because nothing is going to happen that fast. First of all, the American market is incredibly siloed. So even though you have all these big acquisitions and there's a movement of trying to get primary care to be improved, it doesn't happen on the ground nearly as fast as that. And especially with some of these companies you're mentioning, right? So One Medical is a concierge service. It isn't actually everybody who can offer or get that type of primary care services. And so for them to go to Amazon and for me, what I was thinking was that Amazon really wants them for their telehealth because that's what they had. And they have the brick and mortar, which Amazon now has access to. They also have a pharmacy, right? And so with all of that, they can become a a type of primary care practice, but then they need doctors to work for them. So we'll see. You know, I'm not sure how it'll work out, but it's not going to be that quickly. Is it something as a physician that you you would like to happen or is it something that you... I mean, in terms of priority, is it something that you consider as, 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 as highly relevant or do you think it's uh, there are higher priorities? Well, so it's relevant in the way that it can actually help things that are real problems, right? So we have a problem with uh, the way that we bill insurance, right? Things are expensive. We're not good at pre- preventive care, primary care in that manner, so that we have a burden of sicker patients because we don't get screenings, right? Then we have a lot of administrative tax that imp- uh, increase burnout and are not making uh, primary care visits efficient. And then generally just all of the inequities that we have within the system itself. So those are the problems we have. And yes, potentially some of these workflows and automating can help. AI can potentially take out any of the inequity or looking at things from a racial, sexist, whatever thing that is a problem, taking that out of the equation, potentially that can, it can do that. But, uh, is it, yeah, so it's a priority in that manner, but our healthcare system is so complicated and so awful in ways that I can't tell you that it's going to be a priority or that it's going to fix it in one thing. A lot of things have to happen at the same time together. Makes sense, yeah. And you, Tasha, you, you mentioned actually CVS in your intro, so that means you you kind of have a, a closer look at what's happening there. Just want, I mean, on this kind of primary care changing, obviously you're also based in Europe and U.S., be also interesting maybe to, to deepen what you just shared at the, in the intro and, and your view on, on primary care and how technology 
is shaping that. And, and if primary care is the right entry point, in a way, in your opinion, to, to start changing things at scale, basically. I think primary care can do a lot, mostly from the price perspective. You know, like if Cuba is often mentioned as a good example of a good but not expensive uh, healthcare because they have strong primary care. Without going into details, what is important to understand, you know, is that the US market is specific and very different to any uh, EU healthcare systems. It's market driven. That's why we see that all these changes happen because when healthcare is profit driven, the story is completely different. I see AI tools as an important, uh, you know, few future helping too for clinicians. But I'm also a little bit skeptical about just giving these tools to clinicians because they're not, they're still error prone. It's a problem when you have to negate that as a patient. And I have a, an example about, you know, how, for example, if you take depression, how can depression is really, really complex and very time consuming to diagnose and treat accurately. But in order to simplify it, it was kind of uh, offloaded to primary care through a simple uh, questionnaire. It's called the PHQ-9 score. That is very problematic because it gives the primary care doctor a checklist that uh, enables him to write antidepressants. The problem is that for example, if a patient is experiencing ADHD, addiction, eating disorders, trauma, and the clinician does that checklist, it can very quickly classify uh, the patient as depressed, gives him antidepressants, but doesn't really solve the patient's problem. So we really need to ask ourselves, what exactly are we solving here? Are we just solving the issue of giving patients diagnosis and medications, or are we actually looking for improved outcomes and better health? Thanks a lot, um, Chasha. And you, Krupal, I think you talked about a lot about, about quality of life. And I think trying to link it a bit to the, to the topic. I mean, you, you talk about quality of life and, and as well about endometriosis and, and, the, and the time to diagnosis. So my, I will just have two, two theses that I would like to test with you and, and maybe you can react on that. So the first is assuming we, we manage to, to go more upstream and have this kind of super GP, whatever it means and how much time it takes, but assuming that. I mean, we can potentially reduce this time to diagnosis of endometriosis, technically, potentially, or maybe not. It'll be like, uh, like one question. And I think the second question about quality of life, I talked about the super GP, but actually in the meantime, after this post, I had a chat with, uh, with somebody else that called, that told me actually pharmacist are the new primary care. <laughs> so actually you, and I think the, the interesting thing in the thesis of pharmacists or the new GP or PCPs is that pharmacists have potentially more time technically. And I'll see there is a, also a lack of pharmacists and there's a bit of a, of a strategic question for pharmacists to, to redefine a bit what's a pharmacist. Now it's not someone that just sells you pills. It's someone that has more, that can offer more than that. And basically that's happening in France a bit, you know, giving more responsibility to pharmacists and because they are the ones that are, you know, on the front line and there are much more pharmacies than, than PCPs. So they could also, for chronic condition especially, be the kind of, you know, supporting therapies, supporting patients and be the kind of trusted partner because PCPs don't have the time, GPs don't have the time to do that. So in terms of, you know, like this idea of time to diagnosis and this idea of, I mean, quality of life, how do PCPs and pharmacies play together to make I mean, chronic disease in a way, like easier to, to manage. I mean, yeah, I would just understand if you think it's a solution or, or maybe it's the it's not the right way to go. I don't know. There's other ways of <laughs> So it. I'm not the medic here. That's obviously a DT. But what I would say is that they have very different training. And obviously a, a GP or primary PCP is there for a specific reason and a pharmacist is there for a specific reason. What I do know, though, is that pharmacists are very, very busy and there is also a shortage. So I think if you're going to give them more responsibility, we need more pharmacists to be present. So there's a, a tricky aspect there. Maybe they can help with some conditions. I don't know. I don't think I can really comment too much on that because it all depends on the training and the pipeline of pharmacists coming through. But in terms of the quality of life and endometriosis and going back to this 
piece. I think AI has got a long way to go. Just yesterday, I was part of a group at the UN uh, Women's Conference in the UK. And my group actually was centered on AI and who listens to who. So essentially, how can we make differences through AI. But the problem is that AI is also very, it's, there are inherent problems, issues with it. Some of the data isn't always uh, representative. You know, you haven't got good representation of race, ethnicity, gender always in AI. So if we're going to use it, how do we know that it's actually Uh, correct and the diagnosis it's giving is accurate based on the conditions and the research that's been done is representative of the sample to make that change. It's going to be interesting to see where this goes and then my second my well my final point here is that we've got this pose solution but if you look at health equity as a whole are we then creating more of a digital divide? What about people who can't access the latest treatment? Does it become a bit more of a them and, and other situation? Do people who can access this, and I know in the US you have to pay for private medical care, as we can do in the UK, but is it at that point that those people who pay will get better access to treatment and therefore reduce health outcomes as a whole? I'd like to... I just feel like it's a great innovation to be having but the implementation is going to be the most important piece here thanks a lot i think uh, you, you both great points maybe like some topics for the for the next uh, podcast uh, i think uh, i took i took two points i think the the first point about accuracy i find it also a very interesting points i think I, I find it funny because we we are actually all digital health i would say supporters but we we are very no more cautious maybe into and into the way we frame it so that's that maybe we all grew up in a way so that's good uh, but i agree there are still some concerns about the accuracy I, I had some data about symptom checkers and actually if you look at symptom checkers they are not they are not better than the than the pcp or gp you know actually they are they are you know in terms of coverage and accuracy they are all below the gp so we are not there yet in terms of of maturity at least for for this and then the last the, the point you raised about health um, health equity and and will technology widen the gap or will it reduce the gap? I think one example I mentioned was Amazon Clinic, which is in the end, same price or cheaper than the GP. So you could argue in that specific case, it's actually bringing care at a much cheaper cost to efficiency. So it could lower the gap. So that's one one very specific example. On the other hand, I agree. I mean, I think we maybe we all have met with uh, with Bart DeVita. Uh, maybe or we know him uh, from from name, the the activist, uh, open AI activist. I mean, basically structuring the whole system around data, algorithm, and UX. And he's arguing that data and algorithm are being privatized and commercialized. And, and actually, it will more widen the gap by scaling technology than, than reduce it. And he's arguing that actually data and algorithm should be open and just the UX, or the integration, the workflow uh, should be commercialized. And that's where the money should be made only. So, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's a broader topic, obviously. And I think a very, very important uh, point. But yeah, maybe for for the next uh, next podcast, Christoph, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think and Bart will definitely be part of this podcast in in the near future. I have frequent chats with him about OpenAI and uh, and the way that you framed it uh, just a minute ago. So okay, thank you everyone for um, for that discussion. Now let's move to the next segment of the Healthy Season podcast. Is it something, nothing, or everything? So every month, one of the panelists brings an ID, innovation or evolution forward that's sparked their health enthusiasm. The rest of the panel will then debate and share their opinion about it. Do they find it something, nothing or everything? Krupa, what sparked your health enthusiasm this month? So something very interesting in the UK. Basically, what's happening is that very soon customers in the UK will be able to purchase a weight loss jab, so an injection over the counter at pharmacists. The jab is made from the Danish drug maker, Wegovi, um, and has been actually used by some famous people already who have spoken about it. Um, it works by stunting your appetite and mimicking the action of the hormone, which is GLP-1, which basically makes people feel more full. 
and less hungry. So the draft guidelines from the NHS have suggested that they will be people will be able to purchase the jab and a month's supply of pre-filled disposable injections will cost about around £73.25. What they need to do, people who use it, will administer the drug weekly. But there are criteria involved here. Firstly, in order to qualify to use the drug, you need to be overweight. It must have been prescribed by a doctor or a clinician. The patient then has regular follow-up touch points and support for their weight loss journey. And also, they're most likely going to have to accompany this by a controlled diet um, and physical activity. However, what's being seen is that once they come off the drug, their appetite will return to normal. And this can be a side effect because what they tend to do is put the weight back on. And then there's the eating disorder charity have also stated that it should only really be sold under the strictest strictest of conditions and that they have to ensure the NHS GPs, whoever's prescribing it, clinicians, that they conduct stringent physical and mental health checks on the patients who are using them. And the fact is also that it's not a quick fix solution. Now, WeGovi's own trials have shown that the average patient who may use this, they've lost 15% of their body weight within a year, which is three times as much as other drugs. And nearly a third have lost as much as what they would do if they had had surgery. So obviously, it has less burden on the, the system. However, you could have people who become reliant on it and also the fact that you may have, they may need it continuously and also that their appetite may not return and therefore they could end up, uh, sorry, the appetite could return back to normal. Uh, the changes don't get made and as a result, they could need surgery if that is the case. So I thought it was a really interesting article that I came across and the fact that it's going to be sold over the counter. Obviously, there are some preconditions. And uh, my question to the panel is, what do we think? Do we think that this weight loss jab should be available? And do people, should people be able to purchase it? So I'll start actually with Aditi to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I've been talking a lot about this because I, this is one of my clients is actually working on this particular medication and obesity management. So I'll say first, this drug works really well because in the U.S. people are using it already, right? So in controlled environments, so it works really well. And it really, well, let me start with saying this. The way that we treat obesity is as if it's not an actual disease, right? And so the way that this medication works takes away a lot of the burden, like you mentioned. And because it works really well, it actually changes your basically your metabolic profile in general. Okay. And so because of that, when people use it, they're really successful on it. Their health improves. A lot of the other associated diseases that go along with obesity really go away as well. But when you're talking about it needing to be a long term, it is necessary to be on it all the time. That's the problem. Because once you come off of it, most people gain basically at least 60% of their weight back. Now, we don't have long-term studies or data on that. This is all very new, but saying that we're going to have to see how the long-term effects of it are, but it is going to be a drug that people have to be on for longer from what we know now. Most of the controversy that's happened here is not actually from the fact that we're giving this medication to pre-diabetics or diabetics or people who may need them who have comorbidities, right? Because the clinical protocol actually says you have a BMI of 30 or 27 with comorbidities. It's actually being given it to people who may not actually need it for that, but just want to lose weight, right? There's this like a probably overblown, but uh, over... No, over talked about in the news cycle about how celebrities are using it to lose weight. But the, the reality is that's probably just making it sound worse than it is. And it's going to be able to help a lot of patients. And so for me, I think it is a great idea. It should be in a controlled environment. It should be under a doctor's supervision because there are side effects and not everybody can take it, especially to watch your sugar at the very basis, right? But I think it's a great thing. But I will say that I never think anything is everything. So I think any there's nothing that's everything. This is something. Thank you. Can I go next? <laughs> okay, so I've got a few thoughts to share there. There's a lot of things happening in obesity. It's increasing globally. And there's also a lot of research uh, trying to determine is this 
uh, something that's strictly genetic? Is this something that's related to the environment? And for example, in the US, what has happened is that there was this huge uh, study uh, that lasted for several years where they basically um, looked at two schools. So one had healthy behaviors, healthy food, uh, focus on a healthy living, exercise, and the other one was just a regular school. So they didn't implement anything. So obviously the um, uh, assumption was that there would be a difference in the uh, number or the percentage uh, of children with obesity in the healthier school compared to the regular school. And the results actually surprised researchers completely because there was no difference. And it's been it become clear that basically obesity is heavily uh, related to genetic And what this study then caused is that there's a huge change in clinical guidelines in the US in terms of how and when you treat obesity. So there's uh, interventions that are supposed to be taken at much earlier ages. We're talking about even surgeries uh, with uh, children as young as uh, 12. So, you know, there's a huge radical shift in the US in terms of how you treat obesity. Now, the question here is, do we need to again uh, re evaluate this and look at how this study was done because it wouldn't be the first time in medicine that we would basically rely on the results of one study that would then shape the healthcare policy for the next 20 years only for us to realize that basically the whole premise was wrong and this is exactly what happened with fat and sugar where fat was the bad thing and sugar was just normal so now in the US you can get a yogurt that has like 5 to 10 percent of fat but everything is sugarless you know so it's a very complex topic. What I would say matters in this case, for example, is that we need to be, I would say that it would be reasonable to have this in controlled environments. So I definitely wouldn't allow this to be over the counter, just so that we don't get into a situation where there's a uh, medication shortage and the patients that really, really need it and get it per prescription suddenly can't access the drug. Diabetic uh, drugs are interesting because they are used off-label for a lot of things apart from diabetes. So for example, now we're talking about this GLP-1 inhibitor that's used for weight loss, even in healthy subjects. Metformin, which is primarily used for diabetes, is used in by many people if they can get their hands on it for longevity because there's some research in that regard. So I think we just have to be mindful how we regulate this. So, and because we also don't know what are the long-term effects if a healthy person takes this uh, unsupervised. And sometimes when things are not supervised, then we do things the way we believe are good, but may not be because we don't have enough knowledge such as uh, clinicians or pharmacists, for example, would have. Wait, so Krupa in the UK, they're not going to need prescriptions to get it? That I find also fairly questionable. Yeah, I do feel though that it's, if it's, it has to be prescribed by a GP or clinician here. So that's that's what it says. So I believe that they would need a prescription. But the fact is, it's, it's interesting. You can actually just go, this is going to be made available in the UK. So yeah, Aditi, did that answer your question? Isn't it in the States that way that, so you have Wegovi and you have Ozempic? Both are made by Novo Nordisks, but Wegovi is approved for weight loss and Ozempic is used to treat people with diabetes. It's the same drug, but it's branded differently. And uh, one is prescribed and the other one is, is suggested, I believe. I'm not quite 100% sure, but both are approved by, uh, by the FDA. And I think t- if, I, if I can build on that, maybe in, in that particular element, you know, Wegovi and Ozempic, the way that it is used and the way that it is branded, I think what it, what it puts a pressure on is that is weight loss for health outcomes or is weight loss for societal pressure reasons? And we, we're talking about, you know, body positivity trend. We talk, we, we've seen, you know, plus sized models on catwalk. We've seen, you know, fashion magazines featuring women of variety of sizes, etc., saying that this is healthy. And what I think, and I, I looked a little bit deeper into this, this, this drug. And what I saw is that, for example, Weight Watchers, which was, we all know Weight Watchers, was massively successful in the 80s and the 90s, primarily for weight loss. They kind of rebranded themselves. They're no longer called Weight Watchers. It's International WW. And they they say that now it's not about weight loss, or they said that now it's not about weight loss, it's about wellness goals. They removed the word diet pretty much everywhere. 
But now, just recently, with the popularity of Wegovi and Ozempic, what they did is they bought a company called Sequence. It's a digital health company, and they provide telehealth services, but also telehealth prescriptions for these appetite suppressing drugs like Ozempic, Wegovi, and soon to be Monjaro. So while they were moving away from weight loss, they're getting back into the space now again. And of course they say, I mean, it's not about, you know, it's not specifically for people who want to lose 10 pounds. Um, and we want to, we want to add an application that, uh, as you said as well, Krupa, you know, eating and exercise advice, uh, included. But still, I mean, when you think about, you know, the double branding with Govio Zempic, as I mentioned before, you know, it brings to me this sort of, thin line and, and obscurity around is weight loss for health co- outcomes here or is it used for health outcomes or is this medication used for you know societal pressure and it, it's becoming really really difficult to to make that distinction because if you look at what Ozempic has done on TikTok I don't know if you've seen it but there were 74 million hashtags on TikTok using my Ozempic journey, 74 million um, users. So, I mean, I, this really puts it into perspective because Ozempic is, is used to treat people with diabetes. And now suddenly, I mean, it, it, it's trending on TikTok. So to me, that is the biggest thing here. Is it used for weight loss? Is it used for health outcomes? Is it for used for, for societal pressure? It's, it's, a, it's an interesting debate. I just want to make sure that we're very clear that there are metabolic and physical and medical effects of this. So saying that is actually diminishing the actual problem of obesity and all of the health outcomes that are part of it. Also, like with the uh, the Weight Watchers thing, they're actually going to be very strict on their clinical protocols, right? So the whole idea is that they're adding to services they already have. And I think we're going to see more of that too. Yeah, totally, totally agree. But it is remarkable that they went away from weight loss and then going back to weight loss, which I think is, is necessary, of course. But um. I would just add a quick comment there. So I think what, what's interesting in what you said is that basically New Zealand and US are the only two countries that have allowed direct to consumer advertising of drugs, which puts also an immense pressure on what patients demand from their doctors. So when you say that basically there's so many hits on TikTok where basically patients are just sharing their experience with a specific drug, it's technically not advertising, but in in its effect, it's exactly what it is. So I think that's an interesting societal trend that will be interesting to observe to which extent will regulators step in to ban that kind of content from being distributed widely. Thank you. It's a really interesting conversation, debate. Thomas, Let's get your opinion. What do you think? Is it something, nothing, or everything? I think it's. I think it's everything. Actually, I think, and I have to be very careful in the way I chose. I choose my words. I mean, the way I look at it, and I want to put like like things in. Obviously, I think it it will it will have some benefits for sure. And I think in the thick in the in the in the short term, there is this question about is obesity a genetic disease? And I think that's what you just said, Chasha, I think, and what you said, so Aditi, now the American like society, like scientific society thinks it's a genetic disease, which changes the whole and opens a new market. I think, is it a genetic disease? Is not a genetic disease? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a physician. Maybe it is. I just, and I think it comes back a bit to, if it's a genetic disease, why is it increasing? That means our genetic code is like changing into, and I think it does come back to a much higher level, which is a, my core thesis in the end. I mean, it's a bit broader than healthcare, but I think we all, uh, we all uh, read the book, uh, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. I, mean, I think for those who haven't, I think I would really suggest it. I think one of the core thesis of this book is that at core, we are hunter gatherers. Human beings were hunter gatherers. So we should be hunting and gathering. And I think I, I like it because it's a good benchmark. You know, if you think about like, yeah, anyway, what I'm saying is that we're creating a world that is always further away from what we are. So we are under gatherers at heart and we are becoming, and that's why maybe our genetic code is, is changing over time and maybe like no obesity. But there is a bit of a, of a broader question about like a philosophical question about society in general. And I think in a way, I mean, I don't want to put like too much on the philosophical level, but, but at some point, uh, there is this question about, you know, like this kind of user centricity, which is the hot topic right now, is basically reducing pain point is like climbing a stair pain point is, you know, like if you reduce so many pain points, we'll be like, you know, sitting on the couch 
delivered, Uber, every, everything delivered and, and, you know, and take, you know, like, is it the world we want? So in the end, I think there is a bit of a philosophical question to be asked. And I think it comes on to one, one anecdote that I can find interesting is, is if you like what is, is happening in Chile, uh, in Chile, they put like big banners on, hey, don't eat that. It's bad for you, <laughs> you know, in a way. <laughs> so like policy making, you know, and they're also taxing sugar and fat, you know, so it's like, and then if you, th- Tell that to Americans, and I don't I have nothing about Americans. I mean, they, but, but I think they don't understand that. They say, no, it can't be the answer. You know, th- th- there is a bit of a, of a, you know, like everything is a market versus policymaker have to intervene. So what is the right balance between the two? But I think the Chile example and the, and the US, as you said, Chacha, which is crazy if you think about it. If you leak the, the new guidelines for pediatrics at six years old, you will have like private, it's not therapy, but you will have private session with basically to, to, to coach you very intensively. And at 12, if you are still overweight, you will have therapy either with medicines or surgery. It's like kind of, you know, crazy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know for, for me, I find it crazy anyway. But yeah, that, I think it will be a, a quick fix for those that need it and avoid basically the kind of diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart failure path, you know. So if you can avoid those people, pre-diabetes, to take that path, yes. But I think on the broader level, it shouldn't be the answer. And I hope it won't be the answer. And I hope we will, yeah, we'll find policy make, we'll, we'll frame the market in such a way that we can be more hunter gatherers and less, you know, stuck on your, on our sofa doing nothing. Yeah. I think this is a bit, <laughs> no, for me, the, the, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you have to know that normally we have, uh, one of our panelists is called Mo Zuina, and he's the one that always brings this type of uh, philosophy type of reflections. Um, so thank you for stepping in for him uh, today. And thank you everyone for this uh, interesting discussion. It's clearly something, but now time for something else. In this health tourism world, we see the boundaries of industries blurring between the worlds of healthcare, wellness, and consumer businesses. You can see how consumer business are slowly moving into wellness and healthcare space, while the healthcare industry is paying more attention to what is happening outside of their own industry. What brings the following question? What behavior, innovation, or trend from one industry can be worthwhile for another industry? Or in other words, what should we bring inside out or outside in? So this month, I want to talk about a tech company we all know, who 15 to 20 years ago had no real ambition, perhaps, in health and self-care, but who today really becomes one of the strongholders in the digital transformation of healthcare, and that is Google. Every year in March, Google has this one event called the Checkup, and during that event, they announce their recent achievements in helping people living healthier lives. Last year, what they did was that they announced, for example, a study done on atrial fibrillation together with Fitbit. They had local partnerships with Brazil, India, and Japan to make sure that people have access to the right information. And also this year, there was a lot of information shared on how they will improve the lives of people. It was asked on information and search, but it was also related to medical solutions. Medical solutions that could go towards consumers, towards caregivers, towards entire communities or researchers. So I asked the panel to visit the page google.health and tell me what type of solutions or approaches that they were most health enthusiastic about. Koopa, tell me, what did you like about the Google Health solutions out there? So this is going to go back to what we were talking about earlier. And for me, this is centered on their initiative, centered on uh, health equity overall. So we know that there are communities around the world that have long faced disparities and the pandemic has only further widened this gap. Um, Even within the UK, we see a digital divide and we see that across other countries as well. And what I liked around Google was centered across a number of their different products and services. So what I particularly liked was if we take YouTube, for example, their partnership with the Kaiser Family Foundation. And what they're going to do there is bring the work of three different organizations to bring voices of underrepresented and under-resourced communities 
to uh, creating better solutions for mental health, maternal care and health access. So I really liked what they're doing there with YouTube. We talked about AI earlier as well, and Aditi talked about ultrasounds. Google are also doing a lot of work here, and what they're using AI for is improving the detection of breast cancer as well. So here that's reducing the time from screening to diagnosis and really improving the patient experience. And I really, really liked that. And then finally, one which was centred actually on Fitbit. And what they're doing is they're working to improve postpartum care for rural black women and also building um, healthier habits in adolescents facing health disparities. And they've done this by partnering with six researchers and they've given awarded them with $300,000. And it's basically supporting underrepresented researchers who are early in their careers, but yet are working to address health disparities. So their health equity initiative overall is something that attracted me as opposed to in their individual bits that they talk about. Thank you, Krupa. Chessa, what, what do you think of Google and, and what are the initiatives that you believe are worth mentioning or most promising? So uh, I work also in healthcare IT. So the initiative that I find interesting and uh, to watch for is the care studio and their idea of how can you basically consolidate and present data in a more useful format. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. So how can we use the existing clinical data and all the data in healthcare, which is very fragmented, very siloed, to present it better to clinicians? Theoretically speaking, it's an easy idea to understand. In the practical terms, I am a little bit skeptical to which extent Google is the the company that's going to be able to do this because healthcare is specific, which a lot of uh, tech giants have already uh, figured out and gave up on healthcare. But this is definitely the direction that we are going in. So regardless of the uh, fragmentation of data, with the help of natural language processing, and AI, obviously, it's NLP is AI, but uh, it's uh, things are moving in the direction where even if you don't have a structured format of the data, you can structure it with a little bit of or a lot of kind of post uh, cleaning and analysis and NLP that detects what are the clinical concepts in a free text. And that can then be structured. So that's kind of where I'm um, eyeing on. Yeah, the deep learning for the electronic health records as well, right? This is something that uh, that is really astonishing what they could bring to the table. You mentioned you're not quite sure whether Google is the right partner or, or so many tech companies has given up. One year ago, Google announced that they were dismantling the healthcare division. And there was, in my feed on LinkedIn at least, there was um, an, an explosion of people laughing at Google saying, like, you see, it's tech again, they're getting out of it, they don't know what to do with it. I basically spent the entire week or at least several days during that week answering all these posts saying, look, you're totally wrong. I mean, what they did is they they let go of a vertical, a health, a healthcare vertical, but what they will do is they will spread it out across the different verticals, because healthcare, in my opinion, is not a vertical, it's a horizontal business unit. And so it needs to be part of, um, of indeed, YouTube and the search function and the AI business unit and so forth. And so I'm not quite sure whether they're not the right person. I think what to me is super important for Google, and I think they understand it really well, so does Apple, so does Tencent, for example, or Amazon. They, they, they're trying to find their niche and they're trying to find where they can bring a difference. And I think they can bring a lot of difference in, in, in many, many different eras, areas. And they really need to, to be the, the best one in one particular or several particular areas where they can make um, a difference. So I really think that they have a, a huge role to play there. Yeah, you get any feedback on that, Chasa? Or I will just say, let's wait and see, and move on to other speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, what, Thomas, what do you think? No, I think I'm very interested in in, in what Google is doing. Uh, I'm always struggling. I, I'm I'm can f- I can talk easily about Apple, about Microsoft, about Amazon in healthcare. Google is the one that is the most uh, the most difficult to catch because they are as, there is a bit they are everywhere, so they will win, but they are. There are, there are two, you know, the two, two all over the place, away in a way. So this is a bit of the feeling I have, you know. If you look at Google, what so to your question, what impresses me the most 
is the research piece. I mean, they are, and I, I looked at it like, like a few months ago, they are number five, number five in the ranking of the nature index, which measure the impact of scientific papers. So that means they are like before many pharma and they're 20 spots ahead of Microsoft. They're the number one big tech in kind of advanced year research. So they're really like doing this kind of work we don't necessarily like, but they're advancing research. And I think this is maybe for me the most impressive for Google is kind of advancing research. At the same time, they have Google Cloud installed in many hospitals. So that means that they can, as soon as the research is there, they can distribute it in a very, very easy way to providers. So on paper, it and then at the same time, they have search, Google search. <laughs> you know, so they're on the consumer side as well. They're catching people at the beginning of their journey. So they have the three pieces together on paper. It sounds like they will take over healthcare. But at the same time, that's, they're, they're doing so much stuff, you know, like, as you said, David Feinberg, like the head of, of, of Google has uh, left and went to Cerner, you know, Cerner, the, the, like very traditional, <laughs> yet where you think, you know, why this very strange move. So there is a bit like, a, like, like some signs where you think, wow, that's amazing. And sometimes you say, wow, it's going too, too wide in a way, you know, like they're not focusing enough and, and trying to win in one specifically. So it's a bit the feeling I have about, uh, about, about Google in, in general. Yeah. Yeah, but it, as you say, Google in general, it's not only in healthcare. They, they, they have a lot of initiatives that goes all over the place. Um, by the way, to, to, to name some other numbers, I think between 2019 and 2021, uh, Alphabet, which is the venture capital's arm, they, they made about a hundred deals in life science. So almost a quarter of all the deals that was made with, um, you know, Google Ventures and Gradient Ventures and Capital G and whatever, a quarter of them were in life science. So they, they really are all, all in. And another thing that I really liked, which is not really, I mean, it's a part of Google. It's not a company Google. It's the holding Google. That is, it was AlphaFold. Remember AlphaFold? We talked about it in the podcast as well. It's a program developed by DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of, uh, of Alphabet. And they managed to basically predict all the protein structures. So talking about research, I mean, if you actually understand the, all the protein structures, I think it's 200 million or something, then it really, they really can make a huge impact on, on medical and healthcare. So on that note, and I think that's why maybe they always, I mean, Google is a private and they're always like very, they were not open to, to coming back to the open source discussion we had. And I think the interesting thing about AlphaFold is that Bloom, which is an open source AI did the same, solved the same protein folding problem, but that was a group of researchers and they make it open source, which forced AlphaFold to make it open source as well. And I think what Google didn't understand is I think they could take over healthcare by, I know, like keeping kind of everything closed the way they do it. And I understood they'd have to go open source to be peer reviewed in order to be able, and that's a completely, complete shift in the way Google has been all operating in the, in the last, uh, in the last decade, decade. So will they make it? Because it's another way open. You have to be open source to, to scale in healthcare, to be peer reviewed and get the trust. Will they make it? Yeah, that's a nice question. So with these smart words, I'd like to wrap up the Healthy Season podcast for this month. Thank you for listening. If you like the show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform. By the way, you can also find us on the Shift Forward Health channel. It's a podcast channel of thought leaders who are actively designing and building the health and self-care business of tomorrow. For now, I'd like to thank our own thought leaders for their insights and health enthusiasm. Thank you, Aditi Joshi and Krupa Sutar, but also thanks to our guests, Chessa Zeitsch and Thomas Hagemeyer. My name is Christophe Choquet. We are the Health Enthusiasm panel, and we'd love to see you again next month for some more health enthusiasm. Ciao. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again. Thank you.